William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. There's one chap around who never fails to electrify you. He sure can turn it on and turn it off. Am I referring to the state executioner, I wonder? The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A confidential cop enjoys a certain public popularity. He gets haberdashers' circulars in the mail, anonymous threatening letters scented with perfume, and he gets invited to parties. A fancy shindig is thrown somewhere, a special invitation is tossed at ye cop, and no RSVP to it. The host wants you so badly, he comes your way to invite you in person. My would-be host in this one was Badger Boris, the sort of guy newspaper society columns call a, a bon vivant in French. Bon vivant meaning Boris slept all day and stayed up all night. And when the cabbage got thin, all he had to do was go to the bank. The short, moon-faced guy who looked like a cherub weaned on uh, pasteurized champagne. You will, of course, be paid handsomely, Mr. Craig. Paid yet for coming to your big blowout. Mm-hmm. Now I'm really overwhelmed. Stand aside for a body fall. Then you agree to come. After you give me the other inducements. Well, fine foods. I've ordered 200 pounds of buffalo steak. What do I wash it down with? A liqueur qui set. What's that? A Mohammedan beverage. I had it specially flown here from Istanbul. What's for dessert? Raisin cake. Uh, a plebeian touch to offset the noxious effects of a too rich repast. Rich? I just felt the whack of that word. How prosperous will I be going home in the early a.m.? Your fee will be $1,000. Money flown in from Istanbul? Oh, no. American money. I'm your slave, Saeed. (laughs) Sketch out the requirements of my assignment now. I'm giving an intimate costume party for certain selected friends. A masquerade, you understand. You've perhaps read about other famous parties I've given in the past. Who hasn't? Your parties generally make the front pages and uh, the police blotter. Brawls. They always break up in bloody brawls. You are unfortunately accurate. Uh, You will circulate with the guests. And when you sense that any of them are becoming uh, too disputatious... Too hotted up. You will then exercise a tranquilizing influence. Exactly what do I do there? Well, strictly entre nous. A blow shrewdly delivered to uh, the stomach, say, where the damage cannot be seen. I don't want a lawsuit against me. Where do I cart the horizontal guests? After I stiffen him. I have an emergency room set aside. You'll find bandages, smelling salts, and restoratives in it. Well, that's my job. Bouncer with kid gloves. And a tuxedo. You must wear a tuxedo. Uh, And, of course, a mask. You were an honored guest, too. Oh, and uh, one other small chore. Don't tell me. Dilettantes, you said. On my side of the street, we call them deadbeats and freeloaders. They live piling up IOUs. A party sideline with them sometimes is palming somebody's jewels or wallet. Yes. Uh, you will prevent any theft. I don't want that disgrace. Uh, well, are we agreed? Uh, one item remains. I'll need $10 on account. On account of I've got to rent a tux. <laughs> I attended the party wearing a straitjacket, a tuxedo, a mask, and a noose around my neck. That would be the black bow tie. An intimate crowd like Badger Boris had promised. Everybody in costume and mask. And all of them milling around the food and drink. And each other. I got up on a balcony for a better view of the menagerie. Up on the balcony with me was a society photographer. A guy in striped pants who looked like an unemployed diplomat. He was taking flashbulb pictures. I watched him until I felt a hot breath on my neck. Mr. Craig... Oh, hi, boss. Call me Mr. Boris, please. I dislike informality. Uh, You've got a problem? Uh, This is the wrong station for you here on the balcony. It is? I don't like you looking down on my guests. I'm not. They're looking up to me. Uh, Mingling with them, you can overhear and anticipate. 
prevent any disorder by forestalling it. Okay, I'll get down off my perch. Besides, the ladies below resent the standoffish male. You must dance with them and flatter them and be witty. Witty? Say, can you tell me a few fast jokes? I got down and mingled. I wrestled through a few dances with a lady who had one stomach in front of her and one in reserve. She was costumed as a witch and wore a pink mask. You dance beautifully, Mr. Uh... Uh Uh-uh. No name dropping. Everybody's incognito until midnight. That's how Boris wants it. Uh, this, uh, step I'm doing, lady, uh... Yes? It's a one step. My grandfather had no further use for it, so he... He gave it to me. (laughs) I love being gay. Oh, do you, my potted flower? (laughs) Your wit, it is a sharp rapier thrust. Ah, don't let me slice off too much of your funny bone now. Uh, Shall we trip it over to the punch bowl? No, I prefer this intoxication. Your strong arm. My barking dogs. Lady, uh, what's more around, I'll, I'll need an oxygen tent. Why, you are unusually winded. All right, you rest somewhere. My headdress is awry. I'll go repair it. Godspeed and amen. We'll meet out on the patio in five minutes. Oh, 20, 20. I, I don't want to overdo this. In 20 minutes. It will be midnight then. We'll unmask together. A rendezvous on the patio. Two alone under the moon. Me and an oversized dame dying to kick me around for kicks. Ah, uh, earning a living sure came hard. Midnight happened, uh, like it usually does. I sneaked off to look for my witch on the patio. The patio was sleek flagstone with a floral display on it, like a high-class funeral parlor. It was a moon that had a bloodshot look to it, as if it didn't sleep days. It was a small wind that poets and advertising copywriters like to call zephyrs. I found my bewitching witch on a love seat swing made out of wrought iron. She had her arms outstretched like a snake about to give you constrictions. The rest of her was in a sprawl. When I reached her, my worries ceased. She wasn't being amorous. She was asleep as if she'd passed out. Two seconds later, I changed my diagnosis. She was in another condition altogether. She was defunct, dead. There was blood all over her costume, like she'd been stabbed over the heart by a knife or a dagger. But the weapon wasn't around. At least I couldn't see it. But then the way the situation stacked up, I had eyes only for the corpse. I conducted some post-mortems with my client, Badger Boris. I checked over his guest list. Twelve guests. Is that the net count, Boris? Yes, uh, twelve excluding you, Mr. Craig. But then you weren't really a guest. Who was the murder victim? Cora Wilmer. Cora Wilmer. Let me see. I don't find her name on your guest list. How come? Cora Wilmer, um, the late Cora Wilmer, I mean, crashed the party. Symbolically enough, she was the 13th guest. Tell me about Cora. Gross, foolish, and very rich. A middle-aged matron, miserably in quest of the elixir of youth. Chop it up. Cora was 50. She affected the mannerisms of 20. That sounds like a young husband in the picture she was trying to keep up with. Astute of you. Yes, there was a younger husband. A bit player in theatricals whose dream is to play Hamlet, the melancholy Dane. Was he here tonight? You have the guest list. Yeah. Mark Wilmer. What costume was he wearing? I've already given you a clue. Hamlet, the melancholy Great Dane. How did Cora and Mark feel about each other, or don't you know? I would venture that they despised each other. May and December, Mr. Craig. The seasons are inimical and antithetical. You keep clobbering me with words. Call Mark Wilmer in here for a little questioning. I can't. He's gone home. I gave orders. Nobody leaves. <laughs> Mark Wilmer or any of my guests don't respond to orders, as you will discover. Call a crash, you say. But Mark was an invited guest. Then who came coupled with Mark? Well, the Queen of Sheba. Yeah, I saw the costume. A dish in harem silk with a ruby glued to her forehead. Who is she on this guest list? Uh, Rita Romaine. A uh, heat wave? Yes, if you must express it so commonly. She was the poster girl for the Inter-Allied Fruit Pickers Convention last year. 
Boat manufacturers proclaimed her Miss Cabin Cruiser of 1953. And Mark nominated her to be Queen Empress of his heart, soul, and liver. You're trying awfully hard to supply me with a motive, Boris. Am I? And I thought I was being so ingeniously subtle. A May-December marriage that ended in divorce by murder and a doll who won the hearts of married men. I hurried over to the Wilmer house. There was a wind nipping it up, the parlor floor lights were on brightly, and a piano was going. A late hour, kind of, for a piano. It was 4 a.m. I decided not to announce myself. Instead, I crossed the big lawn and found a station just outside the big French window. There was a hard-looking character inside, standing over the pianist. He had the look of a private eye. I made that guess anyhow. I also guessed the pianist to be the new widower, Mark Wilmer. I got an earful. Uh, Wilmer. Yes? You're ignoring me, Sonny. You got lost in Beethoven. List. I'm playing list. Now let's start playing truth or consequences, huh? I hear I lost a rich client. Yes, you have. Corey's dead. But you have a new client now. It's you. Yes, me. Hmm. Sounds like you're trying to bribe me. I'll be accused of it. They'll say I murdered my wife for her money. Money and how? A lot of loot falls into your lap. They'll say I did it to be free to marry Rita Romaine. That I was secretly in love with Rita. Which you are, Sonny. They'll subpoena Gurko, a private detective, and put him on the witness stand. And I'll testify the late Cora Wilmer hired me on the QT. I was to check with her once every 24 hours and see if she was still alive. She was that scared. Cora pretended her fear to humiliate me. I've got other facts, Sonny, in my little notebook. I read this off to the court. Uh, February 16th at 10 p.m., the defendant, Mark Wilmer, attempted strangling his wife, Cora. A Dr. Enright treated her for throat bruises and shot. Cora baited me into assaulting her, to hold a weapon over me, to keep me from ever leaving her. Maybe, but who'll believe you? That's why you're working for me now. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. You know, what you're asking is a lot, Sonny. I got a big investment in my license. A lot of loot falls into my lap. How much do you like money, Gurko? Oh, who doesn't like money? The, uh, bribe has to come pretty high for me to be tempted to forget my duty. It will be high. Even higher than your dreams, Gurko. A big bribe. Offer and acceptance. Some husbands had their own tender way of mourning the dead. I'd really gotten an earful. When the private eye Gurko had wrapped up his deal and scrammed, I walked in through the big French windows and introduced myself to Mark Wilmer. Police persecution is beginning early. Early? Your wife's very cold. She's been dead a uh, hundred years. I don't like your informal entrance, Mr. Craig. Next murder, I'll come down the chimney. How long... How long have you been outside those windows? How long? Oh, I only just arrived. Now, that's a funny question. Please get your business over with. I'm dog-tired and verging on collapse. The $64 question. Answer it for me. I did not murder Cora Wilmer. You had motive to. Your marriage wasn't too uh, divine... There was another woman in your life. We had certain incompatibilities, my wife Cora and I. But we reconciled them tonight. We made peace with each other, patched things up, decided to give ourselves another try. But you escorted Rita Romaine to Boris's party. That's untrue. I went to Boris's with my wife. I found Miss Romaine there. That's your story. That's the truth. Boris says otherwise. Why would Boris lie? Ask Boris. I will. What made you reconcile with a wife you obviously, uh, we'll say, disliked? Utility. Cora couldn't be discarded decently in an adult way. She had a way of insinuating herself, taking hold and holding on. I couldn't stand up to the war against her. It was too, too wearing, too morbid. I realized that and gave up trying to win my freedom from her. You gave up Rita Romaine? I gave up dreaming. But now with your wife uh, conveniently dead... My personal situation isn't improved, it's worse. You mean jail? I mean jail. Not if you're innocent of murder. 
That won't matter. I'll deny it, but I'll be condemned. The outlook is very black. I married for money. That's a count against me. I had violent scenes with my wife. I loved another woman. That will hang me. Pretty fatalistic outlook. I'm a realist. Hard luck has dogged me since I can remember. I'm never on top of a life situation. I've lived my life without a laugh, without a light moment. I'll cry the day after tomorrow. You were Hamlet in costume at tonight's party. Yes, I was. If you like. Here it is. The belt around the waist with the scabbard attached. What about it? The scabbard is empty. Where is the dagger that goes with it? Dagger? I didn't know that there was it. Was that how Cora was murdered? A dagger into the heart. Oh. I told you I'd deny it, but I'd be condemned anyhow. A missing dagger in my costume. It's typical of my luck. Then you won't try to explain it? I can't explain it, Mr. Craig. I can't explain it because I simply don't know. <laughs> Back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig in just a moment. And now, back to William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. A guy on the edge of becoming delirious, you leave him for another day, a calmer time. Besides, I needed sleep myself. I got into my car... I just pulled away from the curb when I got noticed that sleep was going to be a missing ingredient in my future. A try at murder number two. Yours truly, the victim. I drove around the block and around again with my headlights out, watching for a car somewhere to come to life, start up and show the glow of its taillight. My car was the only way the rifleman could quit the area. The area was suburban, way off of the main hub. No taxis, no bus lines, and it was 4 a.m. Somebody had to try and escape by an automobile parked somewhere in the vicinity. All I had to do was cruise around and watch and hope. When I saw it, I saw the taillight first. A car starting up a half block away, pulling away from the curb. I raced over to it. I cut across its path, trapping it. A lady motorist took offense at what I'd done. Mister, you're in my way. That was the understatement of the century. I got out to go hunt for a rifle. Sorry to be so melodramatic, miss. Uh, uh, Romaine, isn't it? Yes. How did you know my name? Search me. It was the first name that popped into my head. I want to look in the back of your car, beautiful. You have no right. Don't please overplay the indignation, doll. I'm a detective. I'm at work. Well, I don't find it. Find what? A rifle used on me a little while ago. This whole thing is absurd. Yes, isn't it? I'd apologize, only I found something even more exciting than a rifle. You found something? Right on the back seat, wedged into a cushion. A dagger, beautiful. More specifically, a bloodstained dagger. <laughs> we kept company, the Queen of Sheba and me, in a roadside diner. We split a gallon of black coffee down the middle while she poured out her sad tale. I don't know how to explain that dagger, Mr. Craig. Mr. Craig? It's too early in the morning for stiff formality. Very. What were you doing parked down the street from the Wilma place? I was going to see Mark. How he was. Just outside, starting up his walk, I thought better of it. It looked too compromising at that hour. I changed my mind. I went back to my car. You went to see Mark Wilma hardly two hours after the murder of his wife? Yes, I know it was terribly foolish, but I've never made a secret of my feeling for Mark. So confess it to me. I'm desperately in love with him. It's not so shameful as it seems. You see, I knew Mark first, before Cora did. We were engaged to be married. We had wonderful plans. Mark was afraid of our poverty. We were surely defeated because of the desperate lack of money, he said. Our marriage could not succeed. He kept adding postponement, postponement... Until, until... Until Cora happened along. Rich, possessive. She played on Mark's weakness. 
His insecurity is overvalue of money. She bought him. Mark never really broke our engagement. He just eloped with Cora. Why would your recent party host, Badger Boris, try to throw suspicion on Mark? To hurt me through Mark. Boris, well, he fancies me. I've laughed at his advances, turned down his proposals of marriage, but Boris doesn't forget or even forgive. He harbors grudges. He's a horribly twisted egotist. Did you go to the party with Mark Wilma? No, I came alone. Mark came with Cora. And Boris did lie to me. I now have three capital suspects. Three suspects? Mark, wanting out of his marriage, out with profit. You to get rid of a rival who'd stolen your dearly beloved. And now Badger Boris to beat you over the head by framing the man you love. Now let's go, doll. I'm under arrest. House custody. Your own house, this is. The dagger was too conveniently where I could find it. I don't think you could be that careless about a murder weapon. Or could you? <laughs> While catching a snooze on my office chair, a visitor barged in. The private eye, Gurko, just a little tipsy, like he'd been celebrating something. Celebrating his windfall was my idea, but I wasn't saying it aloud. Barry Craig? None other than. Well, hello, colleague. Gurko's the name. I'm a private dick like you. The assumption is debatable. I don't get the crack. It's a delicate question of morals, but skip it. What brings you staggering? I'm here to say my piece about Mark Wilmer. So say it. Wilmer is an okay guy. He's a good, upstanding man, I want you to know. And very rich. That is, if he beats the electric chair. I investigated Wilmer, turned him inside out. Not a spot on him, not a blemish. The boy can look the world square in the eye. Goodbye. I'm not finished. You are. It's either out the door or through it. Oh, you're unsociable. I don't like investigators who talk glibly in their own cause. Out. You know something? You're nuts. Now, why did I come talk to a nut? The way I keep knocking myself out defending people. I got Boris on the phone. Hello? Boris, this is Barry Craig speaking. It's noon. Time to rise and shine. What do you want? Those party photographs I saw being taken last night. I want them. Why? Well, a lot of reasons. One of them is uh, I want to see if Mark Wilma wore a dagger and a scabbard on his costume. I'm afraid I must disappoint you. Meaning? I destroyed the pictures. Come again? The party was such a distressing bore, Mr. Craig. Hardly worth the sentimental memorial of pictures. I dislike preserving dismal memories, so I destroyed the pictures. You find me eccentric. Only phony. Phony is a nine dollar bill. Goodbye. I stopped in to see Badger Boris personally without appointment. You have no business molesting me. I know. Home is your castle. The pictures or the negatives. I want them, Boris. But I told you I destroyed them. Yeah, you told me. The memory of last night is acid in your soul. So why preserve it? Cute ad lib. You've got a genius for evasion. Now come across. I'll have you thrown out of here. We'll hit the sidewalk together. We'll ride downtown arm in arm. So close because we're handcuffed together. Let's uh, measure your wrist for size. You, you, you would dare handcuff me? And arrest you. Suspicion of murder. You're sure going to look elegant penned up with the rabble. Well... Well, you argue resourcefully. You've uncovered my one weak spot. I am allergic to odors. I could never tolerate the reek of your prison rabble. The negatives, you'll find them in that cabinet there. The bottom drawer. Take them and go. I'll take them and go after you write a check for $1,000. My agreed fee for last night's rhubarb. <laughs> Don't look so pained, host. <laughs> I had the negatives developed, eight rolls of them. I had them developed with a prayer, a prayer that my hunch on the film would pay off. When I got a look at the developed pictures, I went traveling, downtown to a Park Row office with a shingle on it that read the Gurko Agency. 
I let myself in with a skeleton key to wait for Gurko. I wanted to surprise Gurko with a bang. Gurko rolled in at the stroke of three. I waited until his head showed. Then I came down on the target. Oh. When he came to enough to stare up at me groggily, we got down to cases. You slugged me, Craig. Why? A uh, precaution to take the fright out of you. I checked into your background a bit. What you did before you became a blackmailing shamus. You were a champ boxer, runner-up for the light heavyweight title. I didn't relish coming to blows with you. I want my nose looking exactly like it looks. What's your play? An arrest. I'm arresting you for blackmail and murder. I said you were a nut. I developed rolls of film taken at Boris's costume party. Mark Wilmer never carried a dagger in a scabbard. I've got pictures covering the whole evening. No dagger ever in Mark Wilmer's costume. So what? Boris's guest list totaled 12, so Boris said. Boris was faking it was actually 13, officially. He wanted me to think Cora Wilmer crashed the party and that Mark Wilmer came with Rita. All over my head, Craig. Try getting up, I'll crack down on you. I've got pictures showing that there was even more than 13 guests. That's excluding me. On one picture, I count 14. 14 guests. The 14th was the murderer. Boris knew it, but he tried to cover it up. Not that he wanted to spare you, Gurko. But because he preferred seeing Mark Wilmer take the rap. He hoped to frame Mark. Your turn to talk. Craig, what kind of guy are you? Try me out. That's better. <laughs> I didn't figure you to be an angel. I didn't see any wings. 50-50. We'll split a fortune. If I shut up about your murdering your own client, Cora Wilmer, so you could blackmail her widowed husband? Yeah. Yeah, that was the play. Mark was a frightened pigeon. Forget Cora, Craig. Nobody cried when she died. It comes out fine for everybody. Mark and the doll, Rita, they get married. They got dough. And you and me, we got dough. It still needs a fall guy. Boris, we'll pin it on Boris. We'll switch it around. Boris was out to frame a guy he hated, Mark Wilmer. I'll think up a way. Like you planted a dagger in Rita's car? Well, I did that to confuse things. Take some of the heat off Mark. And that rifle shot at me? Well, that was to scare you away. Only that. Hang the frame on Boris. Make him the fall guy. I think I know a way, Craig. Don't pick your brains too hard. The little gray matter you've got, Durko, concentrate on how you can beat the electric chair. Oh. It's like that, eh? Uh, you suck at me. No deal. You're turning me in, huh? That's right. Why? I could say for the honor of the profession, colleague. But uh, that would be corny, wouldn't it? You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. (laughs) 